Don't want to have to do that in middle. Um, we can turn that off or it will just let them. Do you want to do that? Um, I'm fine letting them. Hopefully, I'm fine. you think we're going to have a bunch? Um, it just depends. Okay. Yeah, you do whatever you need to do. What? All of a sudden, no, it's not popping out to the side. It's doing this thing. I've never seen it do that. You sure you want to sit there and let everybody in? I mean, you, whatever you want. You can let everybody in. Now you don't have to do that. We'll mute everybody as they come in. Okay, now you want to share screen? Mm -hmm. and yep. All right. Okay. There you go. All right. If you have any problems on down the stairs, just scream at me. Okay, and can they unmute themselves if they have a question? Yes. I sure can. Okay, hey, everybody in Zoom land. If you're so inclined, I'd love for you to come up here, but if you're not, I understand as well. So just uh, yell at me when you have questions and uh, I will do my best to answer. I'm not gonna be watching the chat because it's kind of hard to do everything. It's so weird to, it's so weird to um, teach this way, right? It's just, it's just very, very, uh, it's different for sure. So um, with that being said, we are in Negotiate the Deal, which I know you guys are super excited about, right? Um, first off, I guess I want to start and just say, how's it been going for you guys? Have you guys been making your calls? What have you been doing? Talk to me. What challenges have you had? What successes have you had? Um, what's going on? Um, challenges for me is definitely like phone calling and just trying to, but I feel bad like I'm interrupting someone's day or something. So yeah. that's been the most challenging for me, but I've been trying to um, call my mom's database because she's got a lot more. So yeah. I'll just call her database and either like introduce myself or I've been making these little like referral cards that are like just like little $5 Starbucks gift cards and like my, my card or my brother's card and then like a little um, note on the back from like past clients have referred us and so uh, just calling and like introducing myself asking for their address and sending those out has been one thing I've been doing. Um, yeah I've, I've like made like an Instagram and stuff like that. Good. And yeah. I started like putting stuff on there and then I was Hi. Doing, Good morning. I like um like pamphlets or, like infographics just to kind of help mm -hmm. me also understand the process, but also send out the clients and never like forget the process. Oh, okay. Well, I mean the fact that you're making the calls is crucial because that's yeah. sometimes that's just the hardest thing to do is definitely is. I'm ter <laughs> I'm terrible at that, so I understand. It's just like oh, you feel like you're bothering people. You feel like yeah. you know you just feel bad for calling, but the reality is is most of the time they're happy to hear. You know what I mean? So, well, good for you for trying. What about everybody else? Are y'all having any challenges, triumphs, anything like that? Are y'all making calls or y'all, what are y'all doing? Yeah, mostly doing uh, more messaging like on Facebook, WhatsApp. Yeah. I'm trying to, I feel a little bit more, a little bit more, more uncomfortable to, to making the calls. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, I'm doing open houses. Uh, good. I'm getting some leads. Uh, the conversion part is a little bit hard because most of them uh, say they already have realtors. Uh, yeah. What do you say when they say they have a realtor? Say it's good. 
okay, just especially at open houses, and you don't have to do this, but when somebody comes in at an open house and they say, oh, it's like, do you have a realtor? And they say, yes, we do. Oh, great, who are you working with? And see if they can give you a name, because sometimes that's just a block. I'm not saying we should ever try to go after someone else's client, but then, you know, if just ask, some, just see what happens. Sometimes I'll be like, oh, I'm working with so-and-so over, I don't remember, you know, whatever, but just, just to see. Because sometimes I feel like that's like a like a shield, force field around. They know that. Um, you never want to, obviously, you never, ever, ever want to take anybody's client or even consider it. But with that being said, I think it's conversation, you know, because sometimes it may, they may not really be working with anyone. So just a thought. And then if they say, like, oh, great. I, oh, I, I don't know them, but that company's great. Or, oh, I've heard of them. They do a great job. They'll take care of you, you know, stuff like that. Just a thought. <laughs> All right, what else? Because I do that when I go places and I don't want to talk to salespeople, I kind of leave it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we all do. I mean, think about how you treat other salespeople sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Just looking. Like you won't even, you know, like make contact with the sales guy, right? You're like, just looking. Leave me alone. You right. know, so just think about that. So what about you? Are you? So I'm doing some time. Okay. Um, one of my friends has been giving me her, she did a Facebook ad for a house she sold first in the process of selling and so she's forwarded me a lot of she's done too many referrals that she can handle so she's passed on a bunch to me so i've been calling and emailing them um haven't gotten anything out of that so it is what it is it's good practice um and then i got a listing on phone time wow and so now i'm i'm trying to okay yay awesome that's really great yeah phone time works if you put the time in and just know some days are going to be terrible. And well, like the other day, they had a couple walk in, and I wasn't doing phone time. They had a couple walk in, they're relocating from Georgia, and they're ready to buy. So whoever's doing phone time got that. That's really, yeah. It's encouraging. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like the past five times I've done it, I've had nothing. Well, and but that happens. Still, right. Yeah. Right. But and so it's encouraging to hear that. Yeah. Like I had it last Wednesday, and I had three, and they were weird. So I had one guy. Who want who's looking for a house up by cash in Quinlan, which I don't even know where this is. It's in Timbuktu. Yeah. But you know that now. And the only description he had was it's a house that's across the street from Bum Gardner photograph photography studio that's now closed. Well, luckily, you know. Anyway, bottom line is I passed him on to an agent, a Kelly Williams agent who's up in that area. So she yeah, got that for one sure. because uh, it's too far. Yeah. And then I got a lease leave, and so she finally got her application turned in yesterday. And then I got this lady who wants to sell. So, well, good. You know, that's weird. How, did like you, weird. how did you refer them? Because I have one lease leave that's like in Fort Worth. And oh, that I mean, and I would even take your Fort Worth one because I went and helped Jenny with the Fort Worth one, uh -huh. and that's where her. Is, so oh yeah I would totally it. do for okay work. not even a problem I got all the preparation here so after class do you want yeah I'll take a forward one because okay. for where I live it's, it's not that big it okay not, perfect I was really like where do I find someone that could take a forward yeah. yeah yeah I would even take it um but she found it for me she's like oh yeah we have one agent she's new she's not new but she took some time off and now she's back and she's up in for me and I called her and so now I have her as a contact and she took it Oh, there you go. Yeah, so now I have, and she's apparently out of this office, but. Yeah, and working lease leads, if they're, like I'm with you, I'm not going to work a lease lead that's super far out of where I'm at. Just I live in Addison, so Fort Worth's like, oh, where are you? Yeah, and even, I mean, even in Denton, certain parts of southern Fort Worth, I'm like, you, you just, you always, not you have to be respectful and think about your time. But you also have to think about the clients, Tom, too, because as you guys know, as things are going so fast, whether it's leases or houses, you, you've got to be on it pretty quick. And it's hard mm -hmm. to me. I mean, normally, like if it's a house in Denton, I can run and show and be done in an hour. If it's a house in some places in Fort Worth, I mean, that can be a whole three, four hour ordeal, just getting there, showing the houses and getting back, yeah. you know, so it takes out a lot of your time. So when you think it's time um when you think the time is going to prohibit you from doing other things then it's definitely a good idea to refer it out you know and so. i know if you put it on the keller williams facebook page people seem to mm -hmm. yeah they're really, good about, they're really that. good about that too, yeah so. exactly yeah because my weekly was in saginaw 
Yeah. Okay. So I made my husband right. There you go. <laughs> That's not too bad either. You no. know, Saginaw's a little further north. No. So okay, what about you? How are you doing? Good. I'm you know, I'm struggling with people like not wanting to answer the phone. Mm -hmm. So like what's happened a couple times and I mean I know it's just our generation, they just want to text, which is totally fine by me. But when I text people, I get more feedback, way more feedback than mm -hmm. when I call. Typically if I call, like if I'm just reaching out to my contacts right now, like, you know, just want you to be aware that I'm working for Taylor Williams now, you know, just my introduction, um, I get a, a lot of voicemails, voicemails. Mm -hmm. Or if I send a text like, hey, I was just thinking about you, you know, and then we start a conversation through mm -hmm. text. So I'm really kind of focusing more on that now mm -hmm. than making phone calls. Yeah, I um, agree with that. Like that's happened to me, but everybody keeps saying like phone calls, phone calls, phone calls. So I'm like, am I like, do I have to do phone calls? But I have had the same thing happen to me where I get a lot more. Yeah, and I think once I've established more of a relationship with people that like maybe I haven't talked to in a long time, you know, it's like, why is Brittany yeah, why is she me? Coming? I haven't talked to her in two years. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's a realtor, you know? Um, like once I establish more of a relationship with them, maybe talking on the phone would be more organic. Yeah. Um, but right now, I mean, I don't, I've, I've gotten one person to answer the phone. Yeah. Um, and but I've gotten like, no, I'm not all but maybe phone one phone. or two that have responded to my text messages. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I'm focusing more on that, which my husband's in sales, but like he doesn't have to market himself. It's, you yeah. know, so he's like, no, you have to call, you have to call me. Like, Calling is not helping me right now. I don't know if I'm saying the wrong thing when I no. leave a voicemail or, um, but I'm getting way more response on text messages. Well, I think do what works. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer for anything. Some people phone calls work better. Some people text work better, you know? So I think do whatever you need to do. Um, Cause there's no, there's no, in my mind, there's truly no right or wrong way to do it because everybody's different. The people you interact with are different. You're, you know, you're different. Just do what works. Some people email, some people don't, you, you know what I mean? So, but it, it sounds like you guys are all um, putting in the effort as far as trying to call and make phone calls and texts and things like that. Um, have y'all been making calls in the morning? Have they been making y'all do that? Not really. I feel like We've had it maybe like once or twice. Okay, well then I'm. Oh wait, I'm being recorded. I mean, you really should. Um, anybody on Zoom have anything? Are you there? Did you just put your picture up and like go hang out, and make some breakfast? <laughs> no, I'm here. Okay, so my biggest situation is getting the Fisbo people to call me back. Um. With my voicemails, I state who I am, what I do. I want to know exactly how long the property has been on market. Um, I had a meeting that was scheduled for Saturday and Sunday, and they kind of fizzled out. I guess they got scared or something, um, or they just possibly got busy. I'm all for having a solid conversation with them. Um, I've sent them all of my information, but that's just, that's what I've been dealing with lately. I've been in contact with many different Facebook people that I've added as friends, but haven't yet actually spoken to. And if they don't respond to my message, <laughs> I'm sending them just a few messages here and there. And then if they don't answer, if they're out of state, they're gone. I know that sounds terrible, but it is what it is. And that's wow. it's just how it has to go for the moment so you can't waste too much energy on that right you can try right. but you know it's a dead end it's a dead end and you don't need right. to get dead worse you know what i mean i yeah, know definitely not I agree with that so as soon as i have the ability to expand and i have my license in other states then i'll then i'll go from there other than that eh. yeah okay no i mean and then too, once you start doing more business and then you start posting about it on Facebook and those people see that you're selling houses or you're doing this, that, or the other, you never know, they might reach out to you, you right. know, because they're like, right. oh, I didn't realize that she was selling real estate. Because some people don't even look at their messages, you know what I mean? They just, you know. Right. 
Um, okay, well, that's good. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else have anything to say? Any issues or triumphs or anything like that? Well, I'm going to get started teaching. Um, it's going to be pretty informal. With that being said, if you are on Zoom, just speak up, please. Um, I want this class to be interactive. I don't want to just talk at you guys. That's just that's painful for y'all. It's even more painful for me. So please, please, please ask questions, comments, concerns. Otherwise, it's going to be a long day. I think you've been in, you were in my contracts class right. before, right? Yeah, yeah. So he was in my contracts class up at the board. So he unfortunately he don't get to deal with me again. So, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tori Wilson. Used to be Glazner, got married almost a year ago. Um, been here at Keller Williams over nine years now. Uh, I'm a broker here at the office. I'm actually one of your supervising brokers. So if you ever have questions, contract issues, concerns, feel free to call me. Um, I'll go ahead and put my info right here. That way you guys will have it. And uh, and then if you guys at home want to write it down, my number is 940-300-2060. Okay, 940-300-2060. So as... Um, some of you already know, as like Perry, I help her with things, and Joanne Robinson, I help her. But I'm pretty accessible, and I'm trying to get back to you as soon as I can. So if you have questions, please call me, leave me a message. I will call you back. Let me know what's going on. I'm happy to help. Um, I, I mean that. I really am. And, and if I don't know, then I'll try to point you in the direction of somebody that does. Um, I am a I am a licensed attorney. However, I haven't practiced. Uh, in a while. Um, so a lot of my knowledge comes from contracts and things like that. So from a legal legal perspective, you know, I, I can be, be helpful. So just keep that in mind. Um, somebody come in or out? I keep hearing the doorbell or whatever. So how many of you guys have actually been able to have the opportunity to get, a, get something in contract and negotiate out of contract? Okay, you have, you have. I don't know if anybody else there has, but uh, I have. All right. So in that, what did you think? What were your, what was hard about it? What was easy about it? Was it hard? Was it easy? Um, was it what you thought it would be? Because I think right now, especially, we're not really negotiating, are we? I mean, we're not. But the, let's be honest here. We are not negotiating contracts right now. We are handing over the contract on a silver platter and saying, please, 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 Thank please you. accept this. We'll pay for everything. You know, we'll give you a kidney, whatever you want. Just let us have the house. But in the past, we negotiated quite a bit more. And in the future, we will negotiate quite a bit more. I hope and pray. So with that being said, what did, what, what did y'all run into? Did you run into anything? Was it, was there a lot of negotiation or was, uh, what what'd you run into? I think the hardest thing for me was getting the offer accepted. So yeah. I was working with the buyer. Yeah. And um, it was a lot of putting in offers and like, and honestly, my clients were very willing to put in like above ask mm -hmm. um, and significantly above ask. So it was, it, and it was still difficult. Like we still went mm -hmm. through a ton of houses and offers, but getting accepted, I think, or getting offer accepted was the hardest part. And yeah. then, Luckily, the house that we got accepted for, the lady that lives in it takes extremely good care of the house, so there wasn't a lot of repairs that needed to be negotiated. Good. So it was very few, and the lady accepted all the repairs that we had negotiated out. So right now, we're just waiting for the appraisal okay. um, and the house. We should close on the fifth. Well, there you go. That's good. That's good. Yeah. What about you? Well, I haven't. We haven't gotten two offers yet. I just got my first listing. Oh, so good. we're just getting it on the market, but we haven't gone through any negotiations yet. And then you said as well, this will be, is this going to be your this first? This is my first and okay. pictures today. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about some, even just with, even just like with listings, there's, there's a lot of, here's the thing. Everybody thinks about negotiations between buyer and seller and agent and agent. The reality is, is how much negotiation do we do with our own clients? 
right? Whether it's setting the listing price, being setting realistic expectations on the buy side, whatever that looks like. I mean, I feel like a lot of times I'm negotiating more with my own people than I am the other side because you just have to, they don't understand the process. So you have to be the professional to help them understand that process. You know what I mean? Um, so it all, it, you know, I'm just, I'm kind of going through the book. I know you guys can read the book, but we are going to, we are kind of going to uh, follow it as somewhat of a guideline, you know, as far as what we're going to talk about. But basically it says here we have three different, well, it says two ways that we didn't negotiate during the offer phase with the goal of getting the contract during the option period with repairs. You also negotiate with your clients and now another uh, place where we're seeing negotiation is after the appraisal comes in. Depending on what type of appraisal waiver was done or not done, that's a whole nother negotiation, right? Um, did you have an, do you have an appraisal waiver on your partial? Partial, partial. yeah. To, uh, to list price. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, a lot of people will do full, but I just, I personally recommend, oh, cool. How did this top those compliment a Rosie? Oh, Rosie, do you, you want to say hi real quick? Hello. <laughs> she didn't plan this. this no, I'm just making rounds. I figured I'll start off week good. Hey, well, you have a you have a rest audience, so introduce yourself real quick to everybody. Well, I'll do that. Um, I'm on the home warranty side, so I'm residential warranty services. So I say that little bit house. Okay. RWS. Uh, Y'all know what a home warranty does? The mechanics of a home. Making sure that it was pre-loved and taken care of, maintained. <laughs> Ours, we keep it simple. All of that is it included, so you don't have to think about it. When somebody calls me, I'm just like, how much, uh, what's the score of And I can quote off that because all the options are already done. Mm -hmm. Starts at 435, we do the pre-listing coverage, and there's a $60 admin allowance that you could Tell me, hey, put it to the buy down, you know, make it cheaper. Or after our title, you get it. Do the rest of the form, but we cut you check for six dollars. Okay. But most people do it in the buy down just because it's yeah. Less yeah, less hassle. Uh, that's it. Any other questions? questions? Well, we appreciate you stopping Thank by. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. We appreciate yeah, it. I told Beth, take the meat out if you're watching calories. Don't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's the fun part, though. <laughs> right? You know? Yeah, have a good week. Thank, Thank you. You too. We appreciate it. Okay, sorry. That's fine. Okay. So, um, but we're all, sorry about that, y'all. Um, we are always negotiating throughout the whole time, even before we're getting in contract, before we start looking at houses, etc. I mean, it's just we are always, always, always um, negotiating. You were talking about the waivers and how you were saying something about how the a lot of people do full waivers, but you kind of I don't them. recommend it. Okay, that's what I was gonna ask. So yes, so um, that thank you for finishing. You like get back to it. <laughs> um, okay, so you guys are familiar with the what appraisal waiver form, and really right now, if you go over, you have to use one. Um, now, if you're an FHA or a VA buyer, you are not supposed to use it, but if you're conventional or cash or whatever, you can. Um, but with that being said, option one is a full waiver. I'm going to waive whatever, I don't care where it goes, what have you. Option two, in my mind, is the better option because it puts a, what I like to say, that it puts a floor and a ceiling on what they're willing to pay. So in your case, what was yours, just as the example? It was, I think it was like 285 and then our sell price, or the price that we offered was like 300 Okay, so you did you guaranteed up as long as it appraised at two eighty five, you would do the three hundred, mm -hmm. right? So basically, what that means is, so long as it appraised at two eighty five, she and her client or her clients would be willing to make up fifteen thousand dollars to get up to that three hundred thousand mark. If it appraised at two ninety, they'd only have to do ten. If it appraised at two ninety five, they'd only have to do five. If it appraised at two eighty four, guess what? Now we're back to a renegotiation to where they wouldn't necessarily have to move forward with the property if they didn't need to, or if they didn't want to or feel comfortable. Um, most likely you can just work something out, renegotiate the deal, meet in the middle, something like that. But 
with that being said, what if she did that and she did not do the full or the partial waiver? So then let's say instead of coming in at 285, it comes in at 270 or 275. Um, then if that 300 mark, you're looking at, you know, $20,000, $25,000. And you know, as doing your due diligence with your client, that your client really only has an additional ten or $15,000 to spend. So make sure you have those conversations. If they're made of money and they don't care, I still advise them not to, but if that's something they're, they're really interested in and want to do, they can, but I just think it's so risky, you guys. Um, from a legal perspective, I really feel like in the future, we're gonna have some, some people coming back and getting real mad at some of us. I feel like we're gonna have people that are getting mad about waiving inspections, people that are gonna be getting mad about um, overpaying, because I don't know, none of us know what the market will do. Is it gonna go up? Is it gonna go down? But even if it does go up from where, like, cause I mean, if you have a $275,000 house and you pay 300 for it, it may get to 300 eventually, but when does it actually get there to where whenever you sell it, you're gonna be able to make your liquidity back. So it's, it's very important to have those conversations about what your buyer's capable of, and the ramifications of some of these things that agents are doing. I'm losing offers all day, every day, but it's because it's the right thing to do, honestly. I would rather write 20 offers and get the, my client a good house. And yeah, let's be honest, they're gonna overpay a little bit. There's just no way around it. But if for any reason um, they, you know, if they were to overpay so much that they regretted that decision, who are they going to be upset at? They're going to be upset at me for letting them do it because it's never anybody's, yeah. you know, even if I, you know. So I think it's very important that we have those conversations and, and things like that because I think that people are going to be getting mad at us in the future. Yeah. Question on top of that. Um, so with the partial waiver, have you ever seen anyone or do you know if it's possible to use a waiver under this price? So if, if yeah, so it's, it oh, yeah. you can do it. Yeah, you okay. can just say, hey, as long I, I do it. Um, you know, yes, yes. Okay. Like I'll do say it's 250 and I'm doing 260, but I'm like, hey, as long as it appraises at 245 or 240, we're fine. That's okay. just, but yes, you can. But okay. you can put whatever, that number that's in that second paragraph does not have anything to do with the, Okay. Well, you can put whatever you want. Okay. So, yeah, you could even honestly, you could even say, "Hey, I'll pay ten grand over, but I want it to appraise five grand over minimal." I mean, you can do whatever. I mean, I know I've already done that, but <laughs> I'm just saying, you can do whatever you want. So, um, just yeah, we're we're in a whole other world because we don't really get to negotiate much anymore. So. Um, okay, what do you guys think? When you think negotiating, what are things we need to do? We gotta be professional, right? Boo, even if you don't wanna be and you're so angry at the other agent, you have to be professional. Um, I always say that you're a representation of your client. If you act crazy, they're gonna think your client's crazy. And how many times in, in my business, the other agent was crazy. And I had, you know, you kinda have to let your clients know, hey, I think this may be agent driven. I don't know that it, cause they'll get mad. Oh, those sellers are doing this or those buyers are doing that. But sometimes you kind of know when it's not the buyer or the seller that's directing it, it's really the agent. Um, and, and sometimes you do know, yeah, it's the seller, he's crazy and the listing agent can't reason with him kind of thing. So just remember whenever you're dealing with the other side, they don't ever really get to know your buyers. They don't ever get to really know your sellers. They only know you. So it's very important when you're dealing with them to be very professional and kind. Okay. Um, unfortunately, uh, that's not always the case in this business, but we have to be the best that we can be. It's okay to get upset. Um, I just say, hang up the phone and make sure it's hung up again before you get upset, you know what I mean? Before you start cussing and screaming and yelling. Um, and just remember when you're working with the other party, your goal is, you know, remember your end goal. Your goal is to sign contract. Your goal is to get your clients into contract, right? So just remember that. Um, another thing, and I, 
you know, I, I've learned this a lot over the years is you have to remember that you have to be very careful with what you say, both to the other side and your clients. Um, if you're anxious, your client's going to be anxious. You are, you are the thermostat of the transaction. That's how I like to look at it. If I get all hot, like if I'm angry and hot and stressed and I call my client and they hear that in my voice or I say things, you know, whatever it may be, then they're going to get stressed. So you have to, we have to figure out how we can be the calm one in the transaction, even when we are anything but calm. Um, even when you know, oh no, this isn't good. This isn't going well. We have to make sure that we take a minute calm down before we call the client. So I'll tell you guys, I'll tell you a few stories today, but I feel like I kind of learned better from stories than anything else. But um, I was pretty new uh, and I was working with a first time home buyer. We found this cute little house out in Cross Oaks Ranch and it had been totally remodeled. I mean, it was gorgeous, all new floors and paint and just great house. So um, there was also a roofing sign in the front yard, like the roof had been done and the seller's disclosure said the roof was done. So the, we get it in contract, the inspector comes out there and he's like, the roof hasn't been done. So I contacted the agent and said, Hey, what's going on? It says on the seller's disclosure, it's got a brand new roof and there's a roofing sign in the yard, but the roof hasn't been done. And he said, Oh, well, you know, my client, my client's going to, they're, they're doing that. They're going to get it done, which that's fine. And I think they were, I don't really think they were trying to be dishonest, but the agent didn't disclose to them like, Hey, until it's fixed, we can't say it's fixed kind of thing. He wasn't guiding them through that process. So he, he made, that made me mad, but I was like, okay, whatever, moving on. Well, then my client so happened to work in insurance. So one of her big first things was to go ahead and get her insurance set for her house. Well, are you guys familiar with the insurance process at all and what they do? They pull reports on the property and see a clue report. See, the reports yeah, on it. exactly. So she pulls the report and he um, come to find out there was like a $30,000 blood claim on the house. So that's why it was remodeled and redone and beautiful because they had been on vacation and it had, I think a toilet or something had busted and there it went, okay? So I call the agent and this is where the agent just starts to get real nasty with me and ugly with me. And I was very upset because I'm like, why wasn't this noted on it? Cause it, the thing was we were buying this house in like, I think it was January, February, it happened in August the year before so it wasn't like this was something that happened five years ago that they forgot about okay so i'm like why wasn't this disclosed you know and then he starts arguing with me about the seller's disclosure and says quote unquote there's not a place to put it and uh you make a place you know you write it down at the bottom if you have to make a place to disclose right well he was just really angry with me and i was going back for with my client and I was basically telling her every single thing he said. And this was, keep in mind, this is kind of her second red flag for what happened, right? She already had the roof issue and now we have this, this uh, um, flooding issue. And he, you know, and I was trying to ask him. So then I go back and I say, well, can you just at least give us all the paperwork? Well, he was hemming and hawing over the paperwork. I don't know why this is such a big deal to her. Well, I made the mistake of telling her that, okay? Not saying you should ever keep things from your clients, but did I really need to tell her every little single mean and horrible thing he said? No, because guess what it did? It freaked her out, it ticked her off, and she walked. And so whenever I call him and I said, hey, we're terminating, just don't feel good about this, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden, all the paperwork just shows up and, and it's all legit. It's all been well taken care of because she was worried, obviously what she worried about mold, did they fix it right? And there, all the paperwork was there, but the reality was is that he wasn't professional towards me. He didn't have, he probably didn't tell his clients what needed to be done as far as being very honest on that disclosure. And he was ugly to me. And then I made my own mistakes in being way too honest with my not saying I should have been dishonest, but telling my client everything he said, because 
honestly, if he would have just given me that paperwork, we probably would have been fine and moved on and, and we got in contract. But that led me to believe after that fact and after looking back in it, I really just shouldn't have told her every single nasty thing he said because he said some nasty things that gave her a bad taste in her mouth. She walked away and then she decided I'm not buying a house. So normally you say, it's okay, I'll move on to the next one. But she just was so turned off by the process. And I don't blame her. Um, it was the right decision, you know, but it just, I think it could have went differently if I would have handled things a little differently. But with that being said, I don't know. But I say, I tell you guys that story just to say, you know, be, be conscientious of what you are saying and what you're not saying. And some people you can share, some people will handle things better, they'll understand, but she was a first time home buyer. This was the first experience she'd ever have with trying to find a home, you know, and it just broke her heart. So just keep that in mind whenever you're getting yelled at by the other angel, what you do and don't tell the other side. So, um, uh, summarize, don't repeat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you really, I mean, there were ways that I could have taken care of it um, in a different way, you know, but I could have said what he was saying without the way he was saying it and the words that he was saying it in. I still could have kept her informed, but, you know, could have been a lot different. So just keep that in mind. Um, and then it always talks about continuing. Yes, sorry. No, um, never apologize. Please talk to me, y'all. I just don't want to talk at y'all. Um, do you, speaking of the clue report, do you recommend us pulling that before or at some point, or is that just something? No, that it's something the insurance will do and okay. buyer will take care of it. Okay. So it, it is, I mean, I mean, the reality is if something like that would have popped up even outside of option, we probably could have figured out a way to get out of it or whatever because they didn't disclose the claim or something like that. But um, but yeah, it, normally they'll, be, honestly, insurance is usually one of the last things your people do. And home insurance, is that something that we guide them through or is that something that the lender does? Or um, No, they do it, but you, I think it's a good idea to have names to give okay. them in case they don't have an insurance provider. I recommend going through like brokers, you know, insurance brokers, because then they can quote four or five different, you know, uh, quotes because insurance is a great way to say, because I mean, in, I've had clients that get a crazy quote and tell me and I'm like, mm, I want to call somebody else and they call and it's much more reasonable. So they take care of that. You don't have to worry about that. Do you just kind of remind them to yep. sure and get just remind them. I have a I have a spreadsheet, not a spreadsheet, but like a little word document. And it's really pretty rudimentary, but basically I have check marks for everything. I have here's my upfront paperwork. Here is my um uh, contract and the data paperwork. Here's when the surveys do. Here's title. Here's this. Here's that. And then I have does homeowner have home warranty, home insurance? That way you can ask the question. Utilities. You'd be shocked how many people forget about utilities. So there's so many different things to remind your client of. It's very crucial because if they forget something, it's your fault. Is that something you'd be willing to share with them? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. And the great thing is, the great thing is, it's um, it is uh, editable, so you can make it your own. And I have one for listings too. So if you email me, I'll email you back. We still do that right now. Yeah. <laughs> Corey G. Wilson. I'm glad I asked that question. Like, no, yeah. Like, I feel like I don't know I, if they're willing to share. No, I'm sure. I, I love check-off sheets, and I try and make Same. mine, and then I find I'm missing stuff, and then well, that's what's great. Like, like, I, I'm just, like, oh, like I'll alter it as I go too. You know, like I'll change it every now and then. But it's just a word doc, so you can make it your own. But it's only for like I just put it in. Uh, the front of the like I have my folder and underneath like where I've got all the buyer buyer paperwork and stuff like that it's right on top so every time I open my folder I can go through and see what I need to do basically and it's it's really great because it reminds me to ask them and then I don't hit a check mark until I know oh I have to survey or oh I have this when is the deadline things like that because then it keeps you accountable too um that, that's what I like to do. Is that a G or a Y? 
Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. It's for the Glazer. Can you repeat your email address, please? Yes, ma'am. Hold on. Let me see if I can put it in the chat box. How about that? That would work. Uh, da -da. Let me see here. Pause share, new share. Where's the chat? Do y'all see chat? I don't know. Okay, anyway, let's just do it's Tori, T O R I. G is in Gorilla, Wilson, W I L S O N dot T X at gmail dot com. Y'all got it? Got it. Did you get it? Nope. Okay. All right. Awesome. But yeah, I'll send that to you. And it's pretty, I'm telling you, it's really simple, you know? But it'll uh, it'll uh, it'll help you, and then you can change it and say, "Oh, I don't like that," or "I want to add this," or you know, whatever. Add your own if you have your own things you do during the transaction. Um, okay, so I'll send that to you guys if you later today. Okay. Uh, all right, where were we? Obviously, refer people back to their motivation when you're negotiating, and don't be attached to the outcome. The reality is, especially with buyers, if it doesn't work out move forward find another house it doesn't work out on the sell side you throw it back on the market and you sell the house so if it just know that it's okay if it doesn't work you know um, sometimes it's not supposed to work sometimes it's the right thing that it didn't work um, I had this this one hurt the other day I had a, a couple weeks ago I had some clients that I was showing and I've been showing them for seven months and we had put in a couple offers, put an offer on this house, and we got it. Yay! Okay. <laughs> we get to, it's like I'm so tired, my yays aren't even exciting. So we get to the uh, inspection, and the inspection was terrible. We're talking foundation, we're, the brand new roof was crap. Um, almost everything that could leak was leaking. I mean, you name it, it was needed a new air conditioner, needed this, needed that. My people were first time home buyers, so I just, I was just honest with them. And I just looked, they're like, cause they're like, we just don't know. And I just looked at them and I shook my head, like, no. Cause there was just so much stuff and it was a flip. And so my concern was, is that once they started to fix things, what kind of things would they have found? Like you know what domino. I mean? Huh? It's like a domino. You fix one thing and five more things are really easy to Exactly. Fix. Exactly. So, but you have to know what, and you know what, we may end up looking for another three months before I find them something, but at least it's going to be the right house, you know? Um, but that's, that's hard. That's hard to think about, but you have to put yourself, the, you always have to put the client first, you know? Yes, it's a paycheck to you, to them, it's one of the biggest financial decisions they've ever made, may ever make. And so just keep that in mind. Don't get caught up in the, you know, because if you treat people well, they'll treat you well, you know, and it'll come back to you. So just know sometimes it's okay to walk away from the transaction. Sometimes it need, that one needed to happen. And especially when I called the guy and he was like, well, we were, we were going to replace that HVAC. I'm like, but you didn't, and you didn't even say you were going to until now you're getting called out. So, so when you're negotiating like the house that I'm getting ready to list, I have some concerns about if when it gets, when they start doing the inspections and stuff, when we do get a buyer, because it is an old house, it's the original owners, they're older. I don't think they've really said on top of things, just mm -hmm. my gut. And so how, and I know what they are expecting to get out of it, and it's not unreasonable, but how does that work when you're negotiating repairs? Because I'm projecting a lot of nice long list. Okay. Well, for one, and we'll talk about this, but I think, I think one of the most, whenever we're talking about inspections and negotiating for inspections, I think one of the best things you can do is prepare your clients up front, whether it's on the listing side or the buying side. So on the buying side, especially if they're first time home buyer and they've never seen an inspection report, they don't know what it is, you basically need to let them know before we even get to that moment that, hey, 
um, this inspector is going to come in and he's not going to tell you how great the house is. He's going to tell you how terrible it is. He's going to nitpick it. He's going to rip it apart. But that's so you have all the information that you need to move forward. Because when they get that list, especially on an older home, oh my gosh, it's very, it's very, you know, overwhelming. You know, I'm sure it's going to be several pages. Yeah, and so you just need to, at least on the buy side, I always recommend having that conversation about what an inspector does, you know, and then also just let them know this is what he's seeing today. Things in the future can change as well. This is his condition uh, of the property as of today. So be sure and, you know, ask, you know, just keep that in mind, you know, and then also I tell them, you know, a lot of it, we're going to try to get what we can get fixed. However, you might want to look at it as a to-do list for the other items that, hey, I need to fix this, I need to upkeep this, I need to do this. Um, so I have that conversation with them up front and I feel like it's very helpful because when you don't have that conversation and then the inspector just starts, just about almost everything in a report is deficient in one way or another. Um, and, and usually if you have a good inspector, They'll say, hey, just because I'm already deficient doesn't necessarily mean there's anything truly wrong with it. It could be a code issue or if one small thing is wrong, everything's wrong, you know, and they'll explain those things to them. But I think that's very important. Also, on the list side, um, whenever I am getting ready to list, I always ask them, hey, are all the major systems in the property working to your knowledge, right? So. And then I'll say, you know, your HVAC system, your water heater, foundation, roof, um, plumbing, electrical kind of thing, are all those in working condition or do you know of anything that's not? And if they do, then you might say, well, I would strongly encourage you to go ahead and get that taken care of prior to us listening because that's because that is one of the major systems. That's probably something that a potential buyer would ask for. Okay. Um, and then let them know that you have got um, uh, what the inspector does again. They're going to come in here and they're going to pick your house apart and that's what they're paid to do. They're going to find things that you haven't noticed, you know, because I always say like clients go a little house blind. I don't know if you've ever seen the commercials where they go nose blind in the car and it smells like the dog. It's like a Febreze commercial. You know, they've been in the, they've been in the, they don't even smell, smell, know that it smells bad anymore. Sometimes people are in their house for so long, they don't even notice the issues with it. So a lot of times it's not that they didn't disclose or they're being dishonest, it's just they, they really didn't know. But I mean, I think with that, you know, you just have to kind of take it one day at a time and see what happens. And then just be very upfront with them as well that once they get that report or any information, that has to be disclosed if this buyer walks away. Because I think that's crucial. What was your question? Do you ever suggest getting um, like an F for the mirroring inspection done? No, no, I don't. <laughs> what if the the home that I'm getting ready to list? It's a newer home. Mm -hmm. um, it was built in 2020. They just had their inspection done from the builder, or like I mean, they had their own company come in that did an inspection, and so they have an inspection dated from March 1st. Mm -hmm. What do I need to do with that? So basically you would need to have it, um, uh, you would need to, it says on the seller's disclosure, have you received any written reports within the past four years? Please attach. So personally, I would upload it into metrics or send it to anybody that is interested in the property because technically you're supposed to show them everything, especially with it being that new. Um, sometimes people don't upload them, but with it, it does say, I think, you know what I'm, where I'm talking yeah, about. Say, yeah. yeah, it says within the past, it's four years, and then it'll, right? Yeah, and then it'll ask you, like, who did, who did it, how many pages. So yeah. you can even reference in there. And if you don't just want to put the full report online, mm -hmm. you could just have it ready to share with the agents that have interest. But if they ask. So, yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's allowed, but I've seen, for example, reports where they'll say it, but they won't give it to you unless you ask for it. I think it's fine. I think it's personal. I, I don't know. I mean, technically, it does say attach, right? It says, have you received any reports in the past four years? Do you know where that is? On the um, it's on the bottom. Page. Oh, here it is. Or, yeah, um, it's four or five, page it, five. Yes, attach copies and complete the form. Yeah. So technically, you are supposed to attach it, but I see a lot of people that just 
as long as you're not hiding it, but it might be a good idea just, just to be safe, just go ahead and throw it on there. Because okay. it probably doesn't have a lot anyway mm -hmm. if it's a brand new house. Yeah, they're really minor. Yeah. Really minor. And and some of those were some of those issues corrected as well. Yeah. Because we're touching all the like our person my person has replaced um like a hot water heater yeah. and has done some other stuff and we're attaching the receipts and stuff from the company that did it. We're just attaching it all. Okay. So yeah, I think I think that uh, I think I'm I'm of the opinion that um disclose more versus less. So any other questions on that? If any of this stuff was repaired, well, I know some of it was, but if like some of these minor things that they didn't tell me was repaired, do I need to list that with this report? Um, I don't want them to think that it's still. That's what I'm trying to think. It might be best um, to say, many of the items in the report have been repaired on, like right on the seller's disclosure and then just kind of leave the report as it is. Um, because then they, that, that's a great question. Um, I think that's probably how I would handle it. I would just have to say, maybe the seller could write out, hey, this, this, and this, where many of the issues in the attached report have been corrected or something like that. And then if they want more clarification, then we could always get it for them. But, well, how would y'all handle that? Do you think that's good? I think when we sold our last house, there was stuff like we had an inspector who came in literally who was like, oh yeah, this paint color is not the same. I mean, he nitpicked everything. Um, and so we hand wrote, I mean, some of the stuff was like, you know, the paint and stuff, we did ourselves and like, paste some of these. Yeah. So we just hand wrote, we did this and we gave the paint number and where the extra page was being stored and we were just very detailed and she just attached it when she uploaded it. Well, and you can do that too. So I think it's personal preference. I think as long as you're give as long as you're being honest and telling them what you've done, yeah. I think you're good. Okay, what are we negotiating? Everything. House price and fix it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, come on now. What are we negotiating? Repairs, appraisal. Yes, repairs, appraisal. Price. Price, thank you. What else? Closing cost. Ha ha. When's the last time you've got any of those? Sorry. Um, <laughs> our fees. Yeah, your fees, 100% our fees, what we're going to list their house for. Um, closing dates, conveyances, you know, uh, refrigerators, washers, dryers, all that fun stuff. Even earnest money and option fee. Right, even that's kind of a negotiation right now. Um, and then obviously repairs is the big one for sure. Um, so the earnest money, let's just, just to make sure I refresh my memory. Earnest money is what they show is their good faith money mm -hmm. that they want the house. And yeah. then option fee, which is usually like one to $200 roughly, mm -hmm. is to have an additional time period after the seven day waiting period. Or no. So the option fee is actually start, so you pay an option to say 200 bucks for, let's just say a five to seven day ride. Right now, used to it would be seven to 10. Now it's seven, five to seven if you're lucky. I'm seeing people go even shorter than that. Um, I caution you guys from doing that unless you absolutely have to, just because you need to give the inspector time to inspect the property. So that is when your option period starts. Okay. So your executed date for all in the contract is always day zero, okay? Then from there, if it's seven days, the next day would be day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so on. Seventh day ends at 5 p.m. In that time is where you're supposed to get your negotiate, your uh, inspection, negotiate repairs if needed, or walk away from the contract. Once that seventh day comes and 5 p.m. is clock hits, if you haven't negotiated your repairs or if you haven't backed out, you it is what it is. Um, also, you don't even have that right unless you get that money when you're supposed to. It's a, so much easier now that it goes to the title company. So much easier. Used to, it was very, very difficult. People would just drop it off at the title company without you even wanting it there. Or they would say, oh, it's fine, just do this or just do that. And that's terrifying, right? I hate this chair so much. They're like the most, 
Yeah, yeah, but then it's like, then I, then, then I look like, trust me, I started with that one, then I look like this. I'm not kidding, y'all. I can. Oh. And Ernest and Austin are both due three days, right? Yes. Days. And then if, say, for example, you have your executed date on a Friday, Monday or Sunday, Monday still count as days, it would go to the next, or I'm sorry, say you had your executed date on a Thursday. And then, so technically your third day would be Sunday, it moves over to Monday. Because if okay. it falls on a day that's not a business day or if it's a holiday or something like that, it moves to the next day. Um, but ideally you have it in there on Friday, so. Okay, so obviously, you know, in, in moving forward with negotiating, you definitely wanna prepare. You wanna, you wanna know your client and what their motivations are. So I think it's important that you have those conversations with both buyers and sellers. What do you want here? Do you want a quick sell? Do you want a lot of money? Do you want, what do you want uh, with your buyer? What, what do they want? What kind of house do they want? What kind of house do they really want? What are they willing, you know, where are their, what are their expectations? What do they want? And, and be sure and set realistic expectations with them. Um, especially right now, when I take on a new buyer, I'm telling them, basically what's going on and then the reality of what's going on is this is not going to be easy we're not going to be able to have find a deal you know we're going to have to pay over we're going to have to do appraisal waivers we're going to have to do x y or z because if you don't let them know that ahead of time then what they're going to do is they're going to get real frustrated when they start losing because they're not doing those things because it's going to be frustrating because more than likely even a great buyer is gonna lose a few times before they win right now. It's just the reality of the situation. So I strongly encourage having conversations with them up front, letting them know the good, the bad, and the ugly of what we're in right now. Um, have you have all run into that with any conversations about it, you know, it, with, with clients or what have you? Because I think it's very important to set realistic expectations there. Because that, to me, when it talks about bullet, bulletproofing your transaction and moving forward and getting win-win deals, that is very important that they know what they're getting into. You know, they know that you're about to go to war. <laughs> I mean, but you are. You are. I mean, it's very tough right now. Hopefully that will calm down, but I'd rather give them like worst case scenario than best because then hopefully it won't be as bad as, you know, it could be and we'll find them the property. So um, I think that's very, very important in setting uh, also the sense of urgency. Remember when we used to be able to think about things and like, do we want that house or not? You don't have time. You, you're lucky if you have, if it's Friday, you might have till Sunday to figure it out. You know, I mean, seriously, and that's hard for a lot of people that are really analytical and want to think about things, but the homes are gone. So you also need to set expectations about timelines. As well. <coughs> um, and then on the sell side, uh, sellers are being a little crazy too. They think they're going to get more money than they are and stuff like that. And they may very well get that kind of money, but you still have to look at their property individually, make sure it's priced right, because just because so-and-so down the street or oh, I saw on Zillow or whatever does not always value make, right? So we need to be very honest with them and set realistic expectations with them and just let them know that we price it right the first time because otherwise the longer it sits there, the longer it's going to take to sell. Or, you know, because people say, oh, what? now it's like two weeks and people are like, what's wrong with that? I'm like, oh my gosh, it's been on the house list, you know, the market 14 days. Um, so just keep keep that in mind, keep that in mind. Uh, have a lot of conversations, listen. I think that's so important. Truly hear what, if, if they say something's important, hey, I really want a backyard. Okay, well, why is the backyard important? Or, hey, I really want this. Well, why is that important? Find out those things. Also ask questions about, are you wanting to do anything unique with this property? Are you going to be parking a um, business truck in the front yard? Are you going to want a pool? Are you going to want a storage building? Are you going to want chickens? You know, just have those conversations, see what they like. Um, in one class I was in, somebody told, we always talk about the restrictions, you know, in, in the contract and how that would be where you would ride in if they wanted to build a pool or they wanted to put a storage building, or they wanted to park their boat in the yard, 
well, this this agent got in contract and uh, I, I think the client kept talking about Susie. Oh, Susie's gonna love this backyard. Susie's gonna love this, Susie's gonna love that. Okay, yeah, just kept on going thinking Susie's a kid or a grandkid or something like that. Um, they go to close and then uh, I think a month or two later, the lady that bought the house was running around the neighborhood looking for Susie. Where's Susie? Where's Susie? So, you know, a neighbor's panic. Oh my gosh, it's your daughter. Where is she? We'll help find her. No, it's not my daughter. It's my pig. So Susie was like a pot belly pig. And so come to find out, of course, once the HOA figured out that Susie was a pot belly pig, how do you think that went for Susie? They wanted to make her into bacon, God bless her. And so the lady was not happy because her agent didn't tell her that she couldn't have a pig in her backyard, which let's be honest here, it is a little crazy to think that's your fault, but it's also not. It's our job to say, hey, who's Susie? You know, what's going on there? Because in that case, we could have saved, that lady wouldn't have bought that house. And now she's in trouble and they're finding her and she can't keep her pig. She's got to find a place to free on her pig. So just think about that. I mean, seriously, think about it. How mad would you be if you, because that, that's where it comes in that we have to be the professional. We have to be informed. We have to ask questions because they're looking to us for everything. I don't, that we are the um, expert. They're not. So when it comes to something like that, her client probably just, just her client didn't even her client didn't even think oh that could be an issue whereas you know if i if i you know if Brittany was representing me and i said well i want a real backyard big backyard for my pig Brittany would know okay we're gonna have to figure out where we can can we have a pig can we even have a pig in the city limits so then you'd have to start looking at stuff and things like that so keep that in mind ask questions and figure out um what your clients are wanting to do with the property also, I brought up the work truck stuff because some HOAs do not allow people to park work trucks in the front yard. That's stuff they put in the, in the... It's usually in your HOA dock. Sometimes it's in the CCNRs. It just depends, but it's usually in your HOA dock. So How do you get those? I mean... Well, generally, sometimes you can find stuff online, but the title company is going to be providing it, but you just need to make sure you look at it. Whenever you send, like whenever you put your 20 or 21 day uh, guideline to get the documents in, you need to make sure you're looking at it and reading it, especially if you know that they want to do something unique with that property. Now, okay. wouldn't you have to put it in the like offer that it's um, you're trying to use the house for you, a certain purposes? You, you, you can, can however, you can exactly. also object that that would be oh, your first objection. notice, but you can you can also object again. Okay, so or even if you don't put it in there, mm -hmm. you can still object? Yeah, it's just uh, because even if it's just putting them on notice that you could object to the following activity or whatever. Um, in, uh, but you still, even if with you writing in the contract, you still have to write it again once you see it and you have to put them on notice. And it's all these timelines. You could do a whole class just on making objections. It's fun stuff. So, so basically you put an objection in saying that a client will be being a pot belly pig and parking work truck on the exactly and then when you basically and then if you that, saw that that was not a thing then, then you could uh object again per you know cure this or we can basically back out and then that gives you an out mm -hmm. if you cannot do it and then they yep. get their earnest money back mm -hmm. oh, yes. even after auction mm -hmm. okay. yep but that's that's honestly a lot of the objection stuff that's more common on your bigger pieces of land uh like i know we had an agent in our office that she her client wanted to build a house but per the objections or per the ccnrs it had to be a three thousand square foot house well he didn't want a three thousand square foot house he wanted something smaller so they objected it to it well come to find out the guy couldn't fix it the main developer said no i'm leaving that there it has to be three thousand square feet and then they had to make the decision to move forward but that was a whole process of writing that stuff in now he didn't even write it in on his original contract because he didn't know but once he got those ccnrs and realized the three thousand square footage requirement then he went back and talked about it so it's uh it's fun um okay 
then obviously, I think this is so important. I know, I'm like, oh my We're gonna end up supporting her. Well, wait, hold on, stop shaking your hand. Uh, please it's tell just me. Like, there's a lot of information. Like, how do you know? That you don't what know. Like, oh my god. What yeah. could be an objection? Yeah. Like three thousand square feet. Like if you, like, okay, you can have a pig. Uh, you can have yeah. a truck there, and then come to find out after closing that. Oh wait, no. Well, so I feel like I have a spreadsheet of questions. Like, do you have any animals you should have? That'll well, scare me. Well, I'm going to go through the list. <laughs> well, I think. Okay, and I know that it's a lot, and it's like drinking. You're like, how am I supposed to know any of this? I still learn stuff every day. Uh, her brother will call me with a question and I'll be like, hold on, I have to think about this for a while because it's just <laughs> something I haven't run into. That's what's exciting and terrifying at the same time about real estate because it does challenge you. But with that being said, really, as long as when you get those documents from the title company, don't just check the list off, go through, read and say, and just look at it and say, mm, this seems a little weird. Or if, and make sure you're, hey, we just got these CCNRs in, the covenants in restrictions, you know, look through them, let me know. If you see anything that doesn't work for you. If they have specific questions, hey, why don't we talk, let's let you talk to title about this. If title can answer, hey, why don't we get you with an attorney? You can defer out to other people, but I think so long as you're looking at the stuff that actually comes in, you'll start to see the red flags if there are any, okay? Um, and me personally, whenever I'm going to offer on a piece of land, I know the client wants to build something, I'm always trying to get those restrictions ahead of time because in, it, that way I can at least say, because a lot of it's pretty common, it'll say something like um, brick veneer required, so many square feet required, things like that, no mobile homes, no barn dominiums, whatever it is. And, and you can go ahead and do that before you even make your offer. So it's truly about reading and researching and things like that. And I know you don't know what questions to ask. You just, I think you kind of start figuring it out as you just start getting to know your people. You know, what do they do for a living? Why are they wanting to move to the country? Why do they like this neighborhood? You know, just getting to know them. I, I will tell you, I tell you those stories about the pig or other things like that, but personally, I've not run into a lot of it. Now I've heard about other people. I personally have not run into a lot of it, to be honest with you. Um, but it is like the only thing I can think of is clients that wanted really big, big storage buildings in the backyard and having to make sure that was acceptable and trying to find the information out beforehand. Because if it's anything that's over fence lines and stuff like that, you just gotta, you know, double check. You may have questions because it's flashing orange. Oh. Or not. Did anybody have questions? Ah, I don't even know why I put up this thing. No questions so far. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Blah, blah, blah. Sorry, I don't know why I'm doing this. Yeah, we'll keep it there because we're on prepare, I think. Are we all prepare? I think we're all prepared. Um, and then the other thing is know the documents inside and out. So especially when you're new, know the contract, man. I'm telling you, that can save you so many, I, even in my, that has saved me so many arguments and disagreements, for example. So, I know you like another one. Okay, so Per the contract, it states that utilities have to be left on throughout the duration of the contract. It says it in the listing agreement too. So I had a client, a buyer, and lo and behold, they turned off all their stuff because they didn't want it, you know. Yeah, they didn't want it left on. Well, they can't do that. So I called the agent, I'm like, hey, we were gonna, I think we we're getting like a re-inspection on something or something like that. Hey, um, they're gonna they were gonna go and do this, but the utilities are off. Well, then she's like, well, he just wanted to turn them off. And so at that point, I thought, okay, I could argue with her, or I could just point her to the contract and tell her. So I said, well, you know what? Because you never want to be a know-it-all, but you say, you know what? I just realized, like, he actually has to keep those utilities on because if you look at that paragraph on page blah 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 it states in the contract that he's supposed to leave those utilities on for the whole time oh it does yes ma'am she goes and looks yes it does i'll get right on it fixes it 
just reading some random sentence in a, in a, I mean, that could have been a war over him doing something he was supposed to do part of the contract. So I think that's very helpful. Um, also, what I've run into is people wanting to do crazy stuff with like lease backs and say, oh, well, the buyer's responsible or the seller's responsible for this or the buyer's responsible for the repairs if the seller breaks something. Well, part of the lease back, technically, if the seller's staying in the house, they're they're pretty much responsible for the systems in that house to continue to be in working order and to lay it out. Now, if it's a hailstorm or an insurance claim that's different than anything inside that they're supposed to fix. So whenever people start trying to change stuff or say, oh, no, no, it's not that way, I feel like it's very important to point to that paragraph. So there's a lot of different little things that if you just get to know that contract, it's going to take work off of you because really it's there in black and white. This is what we signed off on. This is what we agreed to. Why are you trying to change it now? You know what I mean? So I think that's very important as well. Anybody have any questions on that or thoughts? Okay. Okay, so this, I'm actually going to read this scenario to you guys. I think it's on your page 16. Uh, it says, your turn, prepare to negotiate. So I want us to read the scenario below. And I, I, I normally I don't, you know, do this, a lot of the stuff in the book, but I think this one's a good one because it think, makes you think about questions. So it says, you are representing a single buyer. Your client is renting her present property. Like any first-time home buyer, she is looking to you to guide her through the process. The asking price, price for the home she loves is 175 k The house appears to have evidence of a roof leak, is listed as is, and is correctly priced. Your client would like to keep her payments as low as possible since she still has a number of student loans to pay off. She wants for her an offer of 155. There's been quite a bit of activity on the listing. So what kind of questions are we going to be asking our client in this in this scenario? Because obviously there's there's a few little red red flags, right? Just read through it again. There are a few red flags. Okay, yeah. So what 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 are what are some of the what are some of the uh, questions you would ask? and what are the red flags you're seeing? The red flag I see is the roof leak and it's selling as is, so it means that the, the seller's most likely not gonna to wanna to negotiate repairs on the leak. Mm -hmm. And then also that there's been quite a bit of activity on the listing, which means that they're most likely getting multiple offers and they're probably closer to the 175 mm -hmm. than the 155. Offer. Yep. Also, the student loans that she has. Mm -hmm. She has a lot of debt that she should be yeah. taking care of before she tries to take on a house as is. Yes. <clears throat> so, what I see this is obvious. Whenever I read this, obviously 175, a lot of activity, like you say, probably going to have multiple offers. Now, she's wanting to do 20 grand below in any market on a new listing, probably not realistic. But when she's talking about that 155 mark, I think, and the student loans, I think it's very important to have those conversations with your client about, well, what, what is your comfort zone with your payment? Because a lot of people will say, oh, I'm approved up to blank. But as far as their monthly payment, that's not really their comfort zone. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it sounds to me, just based on this scenario and nothing else, that her comfort zone might be a smaller payment in the amount for something closer to 155. So if that's the case, that's when you have to have the hard conversation and say, okay, do we really need, you know, that's when you explain the market again, homes are going fast, above asking, blah, blah, blah. Do we really need to be looking at that house, that price point, that 175 price point, or do we need to try to stay under 160 or 150? Um, because to me, it seems it seems like maybe she's looking at houses that are a little over her comfort level. And you just, and I always tell, because I mean, that's a hard conversation to have with someone, but I always tell them, you know, a lot of people are approved for way more than they ever want to spend. So I think it's very important that we get you with a lender and go through kind of what your payment might be on a 150 house, 160 house, 170 house, and see where you're comfortable. Because to me, this if you if you don't have that conversation guess what you're going to be doing you're going to be going and looking at a lot of one hundred and seventy five thousand dollar houses and writing low offers and losing them and who's who's helping that you know 
Yes, exactly. So, um, you know, and then you can also ask it, what, what, you know, do you really, is this truly your house? I mean, it's, you're not willing to pay the full cost or, you know, what are, what, what would you do if they will fix the roof? What would you do if they won't? You know, things like that. Cause the roof issue is a big deal too. And I'd like to be able to know it. I would ask her, you know, you're, and I'm not sure how to word it yet, but if it's a single person, are you able to tackle the home fix it issues yes. that will come with the house that has some issues and is as is? Yeah, especially, yeah, it's because it doesn't sound like it's been, you know, seems like it may have been neglected a little bit. So that's, that's also important to say the what if game, because even with like repairs, I always say, okay, based on this report, is are any of these things deal breakers where you would walk away from the property? Obviously, I'm going to try to get you as much as possible, but just think about that is if they say nope, not fixing a single thing, would you still move forward? Because I don't know if you guys have run into it yet, but sellers are not fixing stuff like they used to. I mean, they're just like, nope, not doing it. Sorry. So then it's that point you have to say, okay, do we want the house with these issues or are these issues okay? Or are we good moving forward? So, Question. Um, yeah. Sorry. Don't apologize. No, uh, I want y'all to talk to me. Otherwise, y'all are all bored and it's physical. Anyway. Um, what's the best way to back into uh, like the full price? So, say you're, you're talking about uh, payments and like what are, what's a comfortable, comfortable payment you're with, you're willing to pay. Mm -hmm. um, what's the best way to back into like a full price? Like, so if you say I don't know, just a random mortgage payment, how do you figure out what that would be in, or like? list for ask price oh well i mean generally what you can do there's different payment calculators um and because basically it's going to be your principal and your interest whatever their interest rate is and then your taxes and insurance the insurance you can just kind of throw something out there and say oh based on this house it's probably going to be fifteen hundred dollars a year it's going to be whatever and then the taxes you can actually look up the taxes and whatever the taxes are for that house you would just do divide it by 12 and add that on there so okay. you divide your insurance by 12 your taxes by 12 and then usually you can at least do the p and i calculator online mm -hmm. and it'll tell you kind of what the principal is because obviously that will change as the last is that like a loan calculator mm -hmm. or something like that? okay yeah. and then on top of that on top of the, the loan calculator that you get you would have to add taxes and interest to that it depends on unless it's seven loan calculators have that in there included. but honestly you guys i personally say talk to the lender okay. because i just think that you know hey i I can give you, we can get a rough estimate, or if you do give an estimate, say this is very rough, this is just for my little app, or this is whatever, just say I would really talk with the lender. And you want to try to get them comfortable with that before, you want to get that number in mind before like, hey, I'm good from anywhere from this to this, anything over that's pushing it. Because generally it's not a huge jump in payment. I think, uh, you know, depending on the price, but it can be, it just depends on what they're comfortable with. Okay. Right. I use the Dave Ramsey app. Oh, okay. And it's quick and dirty. It's not, I mean, it's not exact, but it's close enough to give you a ballpark to if your payment is $1,500 a month or $2,000 yeah. a month. Awesome. Um, and it populates an interest and you can mm -hmm. adjust it if you know what it yeah. is. But it'll put all those. Oh, okay. That's good. It's so, just yeah. a nice little something to use out in the field. Yeah. It's not, it's it asks you a yes. question if there's something there. Yes. Okay. Awesome. And then, of course, we'll send it back to the one. Yeah, I'll always send it back to the uh, okay, so whenever the next thing, the next P is present, but um, basically I always recommend at least trying to call the other agent and have a conversation with them prior to writing your offer up. Um, I want to know if they are, uh, you know, hey, what's going on with the property? Do they need a lease back? What are their, what's important to them? If they want to put quick close, normal close, longer close, you know, just asking questions. Um, I personally, when I call, I will try to ask open-ended questions like, hey, what can you tell me about this house? And a good agent will be pretty tight-lipped. I mean, she'll give me the facts and nothing else. Um, other agents will tell me everything I need to know. And so I just shut up and listen. Oh, well, you know, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but I think if you can make an offer for blah, 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 they'll just accept it. I've had agents tell me that before. I've had agents tell me what their top price was. Oh, well, our best offer is blah, blah, blah. So if you can, if you can go a little over that, we'll accept it. 
I'm telling you guys, I've had it happen. It happens all the time. Now, does it always happen? No, but either way, you still want to call and get information. Oh my gosh, y'all are yawning and I'm looking, I'm like, everybody caffeinate. I'm like, <laughs> hope I'm not putting y'all to sleep too bad. Um, anyway, oh, I heard something. why does it keep saying more? Why is it doing that? Chat, there it is. There we go. Oh, there we go. All right. There we go. Don't be afraid. Yeah, I agree. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Trust me. Well, they can just let you know you're not going to stop. Yeah. Uh, so, but so call the other agent, see what's going on. Do they need a lease back? Do they need a longer closing? A short money isn't everything. It's a big chunk of it, but it, you know, people, I've had people accept offers for other reasons. I had one offer get accepted. We weren't even the best offer, but my clients lived in the same neighborhood and they just wanted a different house. And they loved that neighborhood so much that they said, okay, well, we'll go with them. So, I mean, weird things happen. You just, you just never know. Um, but, you know, just let the agent talk, listen to the agent, ask questions. Also, I recommend if the seller's disclosure or survey T47 is not online, ask for that. I strongly encourage you guys to get that before you ever make your offer because you don't know what's on that seller's disclosure and there could be something they're like, well, one of the ACs isn't running, but we're not fixing it. Or it has a foundation problem, but we're not fixing it. So make sure that you see that seller's disclosure because that could greatly impact the offer that you make. Also find out, do they have a survey in T47? Or if they say, no, I don't have one. And then you can talk to your client about possibly buying that and somebody else didn't call and find that information out, it's nice to have that done because you really want to write that clean offer in order to get your offer accepted. Could you remind me what the T47 is? The T47 is an affidavit for the survey. So the survey itself is obviously the survey, the outline of the house, building lines, fence lines, etc. Um, the T47 states whether or not any changes have been made to the property. So let's say they put in a pool, they added the storage <coughs> building, they extended a patio, had a pergola, whatever that is, um, they would need to disclose it. Hey, since this survey was made in, in 2010, we have made no changes or we have made the following changes. Also, just be aware, if you get the survey in T47 and there have been changes, there's a good chance they're gonna want a new survey. Okay, yeah, so it's like, especially if you're doing that additional survey coverage, you're probably really going to want a new survey. So just keep that in mind. Um, surveys used to be about 405. So now they're going up a little bit is what I've been hearing. Um, but the most expensive one, I mean, on a bigger piece of land, it can be like $800 for like an acre. But what I've been hearing is usually four to 450 on a survey. And cost. if they don't have a survey, they don't need to fill out the T47, correct? Yeah. And then does that need to be listed like an MLS where the buyer is responsible do. for that? I would say yes, buyer, seller has no current survey, buyer to purchase. And they, they don't have to listen, but you can still put it on there. But yes, yeah. Um, also, when you're doing your listing appointment, something else to, to help you and keep you out of trouble is you ask if they have the survey, and then obviously you're going to need the T47 if they do. But if they say, oh yeah, I got it, it's around here somewhere. You do not say that you have a survey until they have it in their hot little hand because you want to talk about it being your fault. It's your fault that they couldn't find it. Well, I had it and I don't know where, because two, once that, once you're in contract, generally what do people put five, seven days to provide the, the first survey to make sure it's okay. It's not a lot of time to go digging through your attic or whatever to find the property survey. So make sure they have it in their hand. Just saying, trust me, been there, done that. What do you usually do whenever there's, um, I think it's called an encroachment, like the, the oh, yeah. like the, the fence is further out from the boundary line or something like that? If you just present it as it is. Okay, it, it usually It's, it's going to be upon title, as to, title and the lender as to whether or not they will accept that. Okay. Like with that deal your brother had. Oh yeah. The they got the foot. brand new, they got the brand, a brand new survey and the, the back shed was all the way over in the, the, or not shed, it was actually the one of the houses was yeah. all the way into the other neighbor's house. Okay. But then if you in look, the house? Well, no, not no, the house, in the property. property. I apologize. Sorry. Well, I know they put them so close to the stage. 
But anyway, but it was all the way into their property. Well, then whenever I looked at the picture, it looked like if that line would have been straightened, part of their, in my mind, the neighbor's property could have encroached into their property. So basically what ended up happening after a couple of hours of sheer panic and confusion is um, after calling everybody and figuring everything out, basically so long as the lender was okay and title was okay, and the buyer was okay, they could move forward. But now I believe what that client is gonna do is get in touch with the city and see if they can't get it replatted to where they're not having to encroach anymore. So they showed me that survey. I was like, because I, the house that I'm currently um, under contract on, it's like an inch of a difference, but I've never heard that. So I was like, oh my gosh, it's encroaching. It's usually, yeah, it's usually not that. Honestly, yeah. encroachments usually are, I've seen more bigger issues out in the country where somebody thought their property line was here and they built a barn and it's like half, and then you have to like pay out that. It's, that's a whole nother mess, but generally they're solvable. Yeah, he showed me that one. He's like, if this one got through, you're fine. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. So he's called, we were, you know, it's like, because we didn't see it until the, you know, the, the table. So he was calling like, oh gosh, what do we do? Um, but, and, and it, that's why that little checklist I send, it has the survey thing on there. So you know, oh, I haven't bought it yet. So that'll always, if it's not checked, you're always reminded and then you can follow up say, because surveys are, that he probably didn't get it because surveyors are so behind right now. They're just taking forever. So how does that work if it is a country address and the city said that the neighbor could do something with a drainage ditch and it took on some, it went on to somebody's, I mean, how does that? Oh, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a lawyer question out there that I'm not in lawyer land today, but that's a whole nother issue of drainage and um, rats and, and that's ugly. So, yeah. It's, hey, question. Uh -huh. you get to T47, they need to do again another circuit, right? No. Um, so the T47 is for whatever survey they have. If you get a brand new survey for the closing, you don't have to have a T47. Like to make sure there hasn't been any changes done. So on the old one. So like if you have the old survey, you want to make sure that like, hey, since I got this survey back in 2010, I haven't changed anything with the property, right? So then um, the, are you heading now? I am, we got pictures of 11. All right, go do it. it. Okay, so, nice to meet you. I'm loving listening to you though. <laughs> I'm really sad about this. Thank you. Um, so when you get that, hey, this is a survey I gave in 2010. Um, I haven't done anything. I haven't made any changes. And then you go to buy my house. I would give that to you along with the affidavit. But then say for whatever reason, they're like, uh, well, something looks a little different or we're not going to accept this survey for whatever reason. Then you would just buy, we would buy a new survey and you would have a brand new survey and no T47. The T47 is only for pre-existing surveys. So and it does have to be notarized. They are still coming by to your house and checking you. Yes, they have to have a survey. Oh, and then as far as like the title company, what title company does is they do Google Earth and see, oh wait, they didn't say there was a pool in that backyard. They didn't say that there was a storage building because they'll do it or they can tell. Or if they saw like, oh, there's a little short uh, fence, um, chain link fence and then now all of a sudden it's like an eight foot cedar board on board fence or, well that's technically a change that should have been listed oh so even fences you have to i tell my people fence even if they put in a new fence right in there fence put on existing or pre-existing fence list i do but again i'm cya and over disclose and hopefully knock on fake wood or real good, I don't know if that is, you know, that keeps me out of trouble. Because that's what you, you know, you just want to over disclose it. Yeah. Um, okay. So also whenever you give, definitely call the other agent, see what they want, chat with your client, see what they're willing to do. And whenever you present, let the agent know you've sent them an offer. You can shoot them a text, give them a call, send it over. Um, also, please, present the offer in the best way that you can, even when you know it's a crap offer. Because I'm telling you, I've had people call me, listen, I'm gonna send you this offer. I know it's not gonna go anywhere, but you know, we'll see what we can do. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, and I get the offer. Sometimes it's terrible, but sometimes 
you never know that could have been like oh my gosh that's five grand higher than what my guy wanted you know what i mean so just always present your offer in the best light um always try to do just a little email hey here's my clients they're approved by preferred lender you know they're flexible you know whatever you want to whatever highlights you want to give them about it but give your offer the best chance um whenever you present your offer so one more question yeah <laughs> Um, do you recommend people doing letters or do you not recommend letters? Do you so, recommend them when you know it, letters, I'll be very honest with you, letters are actually, NIR, National Association of Realtors, is telling all of us not to do letters. Um, the reason for that is they are stating that it could lead to fair housing violations. So if I wrote a letter and talked about my faith or my family or like that, if the idea whether you agree with it or not is if the seller could then say well i'm not i'm not picking that offer i'm picking and he could pick it for whatever reason but then the buyer or buyer's agent could come back and say well they didn't pick our offer because we were jewish or they didn't pick our offer because we were a family or because of this or because of that so with that being said they're strongly um discouraged i believe one state has actually banned them as a law um, I personally think that um, you have to do what your client wants. Um, and if you are sent one, open it, send it to the seller. Just say, hey, I still have to send this. Even if the seller said, I don't want to see them. Once you receive something, you have knowledge of it and your seller has knowledge of it. Okay, there's no way to separate the two. So even if they don't want to see it, you say, I'm sorry. Per law, I still have to submit this to you. It's totally up to you whether or not you open it, but I do have to submit it to you. So I think they work sometimes. Mm -hmm. I think they don't work sometimes. Um, but I, I don't know. It's a hard question to answer. What do you guys think about letters? I mean, I got my offer. The one I got was because of the letters. Yeah. So they, they took it because the, the lady that was grieving, she left her house and she really wanted it to go. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, and, and some people are like, like I got a listing with the letter and pictures and every, I don't recommend pictures, just don't do the pictures, maybe just the letter, but I got pictures and letters and people told me they've got videos with the little kids saying, I want my mommy and daddy to get this house. I'm like, okay, y'all, we've taken it too far, too far, let's call too it down, far. too far, we get it too far, up here. never, anyway, um, but you know, I mean, seriously, they've done videos and all like all that stuff. But like me, being the big-hearted person I am, I see one of those letters. I'm like, he's a single dad and he just wants to play for his family. And then my client's like, what the investor has how much over? Let's pick that one. And I'm sitting there like wanting to like slit my wrist and just you know, because not everybody has a sad story. They're just a good family that wants a home, and but, I know because they don't have a sad story, they're not going to win an offer. I mean, I kind of I kind of see it both ways. I do but, too. I yeah. can see both sides. But like in that case, it didn't matter what kind of story. I, I mean, I think. I think Jesus Christ himself could have wrote the <laughs> offer and my client would have went with more money. I'm just to be honest. I'm sorry. I'm just picturing Jesus Christ selling real estate. I know. Here, it's <laughs> lovely. It's got a fountain. It turns water to wine. I know. Oh, There's no. unlimited dishes <laughs> and loves. Yeah. All the bread you can eat. <laughs> be well, be bring our bread. Um, anyway, but yeah, I mean, it's, I. you are right though, because like you say, like, here's a family and here's a family with a sad story. And then they pick the family with a sad story or what, or the, they don't look at any of them and they pick the investor. It's hard y'all. Yeah. And I say, and I, and I work with a ton of first time home buyers. Those are my people. Like I love those people. They are exhausted, but I love them, you know, because I get more fulfillment on a personal level with a first time home buyer than any other. You know, because when you finally get one, it's like I was a mom, she was a nurse, she was like doing all the ER stuff. We wrote a, on our 11th out offer, we finally got one, 11th. We kept going and going and going, and I knew she was getting ready to quit. I knew it, and then it finally just happened. And it was perfect, but it was hard. But that right there is like, I'm so happy to know she has a good house, you know? So yeah, the letters are iffy, they're tough. Yeah. I think she did one letter and it didn't work and she's like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm just gonna send my offer, take it or leave it kind of thing. So it is tough. 
Okay, any other questions or um, things like that? <clears throat> okay. So positioning, um, this is kind of whenever you're getting into your offer. Um, and what I will tell you, I mean, you can read all through this, but, but one thing I will say is when you're negotiating with the other side and you're stuck on something where we're just not going to agree, find out what's going on. Find out the motivation as to why that's such a no for the seller and such a yes for the buyer. So for example, um, years ago, I had a VA buyer and we finally got them a contract on a house. And the, um, and the, uh, uh, sorry, that, that dinging just like throws, I need more coffee myself though. Um, and so we got in contract on this house. House was in great condition, very small, minor things that were needed to be fixed. However, the fence was leaning in the back. So the young being VA buyers, we didn't know if that would potentially be an issue when the appraiser came out. Did he care about the fence? Because you just never know what an appraiser is going to worry about. So we asked for the fence to be repaired, and the seller was like, "Nope," and and it was about to just, it was about to just blow it all up. It was so stupid, and so because she and me and the agent were just emailing back and forth. Well, then finally I'm like, "Okay, I'm done." I pick up the phone, get the lady. It was like the agent's assistant, but she was doing everything. Get the lady on the phone to say, "Hey." What's going on here? You know, we're really, you know, this is why we want this fixed. It's not just because we want a pretty fence. We want it fixed because we are concerned if the VA appraiser comes out and calls it out, we don't want anything to delay or mess up this closing. So then she tells me, well, they don't want to fix it because they're really tight on money because they're moving into the new house. And um, they're concerned that, you know, uh, you know, they just really don't want to spend that money. And honestly, they've tried to fix it before with the neighbor and the neighbor's been a jerk and he's never wanted to fix it. So they're kind of, it's a sore spot for them too. Like, why would I finally fix it if I'm moving out kind of thing? So in going back and forth, what we said, what we ended up agreeing was, hey, it's okay if they don't fix the fence. However, if it's an appraisal issue, they said they would fix it. And so we moved forward and the appraiser didn't call it out and the fence didn't get fixed. But still, because we stopped, slowed down and had a conversation, I was able to explain things to the buyer. They were able to explain things to the seller. And then we came to an acceptable agreement. So I think it's very important to have conversations about why something's important to the, that person because it really helps. Because if it's just like, I'm saying no, well, I'm saying yes, well, I'm saying no, well, I'm saying yes, how are we ever gonna get there? You know, um, so I, I, I definitely recommend asking those questions, figuring out what's going on. Why are they no on that? Why are they yes on this or what have you? Because that was about to blow up that deal over a fence. Would you just put that on the repair amendment as like, if this happens, then yeah. fix it. If, yeah, if the if fence uh, is, you know, or seller will, you know, something along the lines of seller will repair fence if called out on, okay. on in the appraisal. Because generally, a VA appraiser looks at things like wood rot and termites and bushes touching and things like that. VA appraisals have actually gotten, in my mind, a little more normal. Um, I don't think they're as bad of a word as they used to be, personally. Um, right now, I, who I think is having the hardest time getting offers accepted is just FHA buyers. I think they are having the work, VA right next to them, but I think they're having the worst time. and. Uh, National Association of Realtors is actually trying to work with, it's kind of picked a fight with HUD. So HUD is the um, urban, you know, housing and urban development and basically say, hey, we got to figure out something on these FHA because nobody can get an offer accepted. Why is that just because of the, the cash that they have available? Or? Well, it's a lot of things. So for one, you're not supposed to use the appraisal amendment or uh, the waiver, term, the, the appraisal waiver is a FHA or a VA buyer. So there, there goes that. For two, I think it has negative connotations because of the appraisal and how it has to meet certain standards and things like that. Um, and for three, yeah, I think it's like, well, they're only putting three and a half percent down, which in reality, sometimes the FHA uh, program is cheaper for, um, 
in all in all versus doing a 5% conventional. Even if they have the money for the 5% of the conventional, the FHA three and a half might make more financial sense. But so now they're losing houses, right? And that's the total opposite of what HUD stands for in fair housing. It's not fair. So we're working on it. I talk about a lot of this stuff because I'm up on the board and then the board lets us know and things like that. But it's very interesting stuff because we're definitely, the, the market that we've been in is going to probably change some things is what I think. I really do. Because this is, um, I mean, the, we are at an all-time low on houses and it's so hard to get people accepted. People are going, you know, 30 grand over on a $220,000 house. It probably wasn't even worth 220 to begin with. I know I am a glutton for punishment. So when I lose, I watch the house and see what I lost. And a house that was listed at like 249, uh, we offered 255 or 260, um, probably wasn't even worth that, went for 280. And it was just a 1300, 1400 square foot house. So, but you know, you have to have those conversations with your clients too. Like, look, if it's not the house, it's not the house. And if you don't have 30 grand, you don't have 30 grand. I mean, that's so stupid. I'm sorry, it's a dumb market. Hate it. Christina Luke was telling us about a house that she sold that was like hundred and something thousand dollars over. Oh yeah, the one in uh Not South Ridge. Yeah, it, South Ridge. Yeah, yeah it was the one it was like, that house had a pool and it was like total like everybody Re, like remodeled and everything. Uh -huh. It was beautiful, but the most I've done for me personally, which honestly I haven't had a lot of listings this year. <laughs> it's probably why I'm so tired because I just work with all <laughs> so these buyers. Tired. But 25 grand over, you know, paying for itself, buyer paying for title policy and survey and all that stuff. But My still, friends had offered 31,000 over for one house and they still didn't get it. That's crazy. And I was like, oh my, I want to look, I want to keep an eye on that house because I want to see how much it actually sold for. But uh, we didn't get it. Now, I was, my mom was even like, oh, I'm sure you're going to get this house. And crossing my fingers, we were like, put in an offer on another house just to, in case. And we got the other house. Well, that's good. Yeah. yeah. Um, like, and I will tell you the one where I got 25 grand over, it wasn't even multiple offers. The agent did not call me ahead of time. Uh, she did call, but she didn't ask her out questions. So she's like, we're going to be putting, it's going to be over ask, blah, blah, blah. Y'all got, got anything? No, not yet. You know, and she still, she went 25 grand over. Only one offer. She could have got it for less, but I, you know, what am I going to tell her? Oh no, don't give us that much money. Yeah. You know, and it appraised. Wow. And I thought we had it priced well. Um, okay, let me see here. Have you had any houses not appraised or really? It happens. Oh yeah. <laughs> A lot of times it's whenever I've had it, it's been um difference in measurements. Okay. So the house was measured smaller or something like that. Um, it's been a while since I've had one. Um, but it does, it does happen. Uh, I, another agent had one that was measured, uh, incorrectly and it didn't appraise. And then I'm trying to think who else it happens. When an appraiser comes or drives by whatever. So the house I have right now on tax appraisal, it's listed as like 1800 square feet, but building plans show 1500 square feet. So we priced it at 1500 square feet because we have the floor plan and that documentation. But when an appraiser comes, are they going to? They're going to measure it themselves. They will. Um, how many square feet do you think it is? What do you think is more accurate? I mean, the, the floor plan shows 1536, which is what they thought it was. And then when I showed them the tax, the tax roll, it said 1801 or something like that. So they've been paying taxes on 300 uh, yeah. square yeah um yeah so whatever you whatever you put your um in mattress whatever you put your your square footage at you just need to say the source mm -hmm. and so you'd say in this case i think it only let you say owner and then you could upload it said builder building plan or something okay like and then you could upload the building plan okay because it's going to reflect different on tax rolls so would you have gone with the building plan or with the tax? I always go with tax. You do? Mm -hmm. Just because to me, it's more official, even if it's incorrect. But I, I probably would have done, I probably would have priced it at the 1530, whatever, 
but still let it have the 18. So it'd be lower price per square foot. And then, but just, and then I would make a note, um, something along the lines of building plan states, blah, 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 tax record states. Oh, blah, really? Blah. Where would you put that note? Special uh, uh, private remarks. Okay, private remarks, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, just, but I don't think there's a right or a wrong way. I, I think as long as you're disclosing everything, even then you could say price based off building plan, tax record shows 1800 square feet or whatever. Just to put that out there. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I, I think either way is fine. I generally just go with tax, but tax is wrong a lot. Building plans are wrong a lot. So, um, but I think either way is fine. Any other questions on that? Okay, so here, like in the very back, I'm just gonna go through a few things. There's scripts back there, but I just wanna kind of talk about a few of the items. So one is discussing the buyer's request for the inclusion of seller's personal items. To me, that um, you definitely need to have those conversations with your buyers, especially in this market about Hey, do you really want the refrigerator? Do you really want the washer and dryer? Or do you really want the house? Because in, in my mind, let's focus on getting the house first. And then if we do want in the option period, maybe try to purchase some of the other items, let's do it. But me personally, if I'm looking at a bunch of offers and some may be similar, and I know my clients want to take their appliances, I'm obviously going to go for the offer that doesn't have those included. Um, I just think that, you know, we can, you can definitely negotiate that out, but I don't let that be a focus of your negotiation because don't get bogged down in the small stuff and, and you need to have the conversation with the buyer, um, you know, and just kind of let them know, hey, let's focus on getting the house right now. Let's not, you know, concern ourselves too terribly much with the small. Now, if they're gung ho, like, no, I have to have that refrigerator, then you put it in. Um, but if, if that's not the case, then, you know, don't try not to mess with it. Um, also on the other side of that, when you are listing something, as you know, you always have to ask about what they want excluded in the property. So I always have that conversation. What are things you want to exclude? So things that are typically excluded can be things like, uh, chandeliers, um, uh, curtains, things like that, rods, what have you. So what I like to try to do, if I can, is tell the seller to go ahead and get those items out of the house. Because whenever, and you'll find this out if you haven't already, when you start reading off exclusions, maybe not now, but in the past, the buyer will be like, well, I wanted that. I want that. I don't want to buy this house without that chandelier. I don't want to buy this house without, I love these curtains. I'm, and, they, and they get bogged down in the stupidest little things. So if you can, advise your seller, hey, why don't you go ahead and take down the curtains that you want to take with you? Hey, if you're going to take that chandelier, why don't we get that down and go ahead and put up something similar or, you know, cheaper? Because then you get into the, the issue of, okay, well, if they do take the chandelier, what's the negotiation about what's replaced with it? Because, you, you know, what are they going to put up in its place or ceiling fan or whatever? Um, I know that this is the way I've seen this get ugly before. Um, I had a deal where um, we put an offer in on a property, everything was moving along. And then the listing agent calls me and says, oh my gosh, we, um, I totally forgot to put in that the seller really wants a chandelier in the baby's room. Because it was like one of those little crystal chandeliers. And I, and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, hold on, oh my God, it should be an issue. So I call my guy thinking this isn't going to be an issue. Well, then he says, what's it worth to him? So I'm like, oh my gosh, but it's his decision. You know, like, I think that's crappy. Like, let them have their baby chandelier, you know, but he is like, well, what's it worth to him? So we ended up negotiating more money on a home warranty for them to take their, their uh, chandelier. So it's better to either take that down ahead of time, preferably, but make sure that you have it in your listing agreement, you have it in MLS, and it's on the contract. Because MLS doesn't mean anything, it's just a notice. I could see what you're excluding and say, oh, well, my client wants that stuff and not write it into the contract. So if you know there's exclusions, make sure that you check that they're written in there 
or if there aren't any, again, when you're presenting to your seller, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, we're not doing anything exclusions, just wanted to re-verify that there isn't anything that you want to take, because I'm telling you, you got to continue to have that conversation, because again, when they want to take something, guess whose fault it is? They can do it that way. It's always our fault, y'all. It's so much fun, right? I'm quite excited about just getting yelled at. Um, we already talked about the inspection report and clarifying it. And one thing I always recommend doing is focus on the big stuff with your buyers, foundation, roof, HVAC, uh, plumbing, electrical. Let's not get down, bogged down in the cosmetic stuff. Um, I know that one time I had a buyer and we wanted the, it was a siding and all the siding was kind of needed to be recalked and sealed and stuff. So we asked for that and they did it. But when we went and saw it, it was the most terrible caulking job I'd ever seen. But guess what? They did it. So what was that a lesson for me right there? If it's something cosmetic, if it's painting, if it's caulking, try to really encourage your client to do that. Because I mean, they did it, they gave us a receipt, but they did it themselves. So, but what can we do? They made the repair. Because that's where you, especially with cosmetic, you get into the aesthetics. Uh, true, true, true. They don't have to have with someone licensed, we're only for Yeah, well, yeah, you don't have to have anybody licensed for that. He did it himself. Yeah. So license are uh, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, um, and then sprinkler systems, things like that. No no licensed roofers. There's no licensed foundation people. Um, Wait, roofers don't have licenses? Nope. I did not know that. No. There are some that are parts of different uh, roofer unions and things like that that make it uh, a little better, you know, or like make them have more accreditation, I would say, but they do not have license. It's a problem. Yeah. So, um, so, so just I usually put it on a repair moment. Like professional roofer, okay. just professional, because it needs to be somebody engaged in the trade. So you would just say professional, professional roofer kind of thing. Um, okay. And then also we talked about the non-essential repairs, you know, maybe ask for a, a credit, cash credit, or, you know, something like that instead. Um, and then uh, whenever you do get a low offer, um, encourage your seller to counter it. I know sometimes sellers don't want to counter it, but you just never know where it'll go and how far you can end up, you know, meeting in the middle. Um, I have negotiated stuff that I, when I wrote the offer, I thought there's no way we're going to get this in contract. And we ended up coming to an agreement because we were so low and they were so high. But just, you know, encourage your sellers to, to, to counter back um you know and, and see what happens and then also we were talking about repairs also encourage your seller like hey if this is something big most any buyer is going to want it fixed and if we take it off and put it back on the market for one you either need to disclose it you need to disclose it and fix it pretty much because any buyer is going to want it so unless you get a cash buyer um, and explain to them about certain repairs, like that might be needed for appraisal purposes. You know, like, I mean, if it has cracks all throughout it and has a huge foundation problem, an appraiser can flag that. Um, so just keep, just remind them that it is important, not saying they have to do everything, but let's try to make this work because I always tell my people too, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. Because while this, you may think this buyer is being unreasonable and asking for all these repairs, the second buyer could come and ask for 10 times more. Um, and like you were asking about the pre-inspection, I don't advise doing those because inspector A will find some stuff and then inspector B will find some different stuff that inspector A didn't find and vice versa. So to me, it just confuses the process even more. Um, if they want to go around and think like, okay, is this working? Is it, can I, you know, if they want to go and get an HVAC guy to check their HVAC or a plumber to check their plumbing or just to make sure things are in working order, I'm okay with that. But once you have that report, you have to disclose it. Yeah. And then on top of that, there's no guarantee that, and then their inspector might not find some of the stuff your inspector did. You know, it, it's really, I just don't see, maybe some people see the purpose in it. I don't, I just think it adds more confusion when it comes to uh, negotiating. And then I think that's about it. Um, 
I'm just going to kind of open it up and just say, hey, what questions, comments, concerns do you have? Hopefully that was a little bit helpful. Negotiate is pretty, it's one of the quicker classes, so y'all get out here earlier. But um, but anyway, what do y'all have for me here? Any, any thoughts or? So as of the inspection, let's say uh, the inspector didn't find any issues in like two months after the buyer finds an issue. Mm -hmm. Let's say we, we, we pay three AC. Mm -hmm. Who's going to be responsible to pay for the fees? The buyer. The buyer. Mm -hmm. Because the inspector is only inspecting. Now, if it's something blatant that should have been caught, then yeah, that buyer could probably go back to the inspector or the HVAC company or whoever and say, hey, why wasn't this caught and get an explanation. But the reality is, is nine times out of 10, it's part of home ownership, you know? I always tell people to just be keep in mind that once you move into a house, you're changing owners. So whereas the previous owner may have kept the AC on 76 all day and you move in and you're keeping it on 68, that HVAC might be like, uh, what's going on? And it could cause it to break because it hasn't been running for the past five years. It's never run anything under 74, you know? So there's different things that can happen. Um, but generally, yeah, I mean, you just have to say it's a home. Well, it's the joy and pain of home ownership, right? Is how you own a home, but you also own the problems. Hopefully so, they have a home yeah, hopefully they do. And it, that's another thing. So then you also could have your home warranty like that lady came in here and talked about. Um, a lot of times I'm not able to get the seller to pay for it. They're just not doing it. So just talk to your client about it. We have, a, we have that residential service contract form that says I choose or choose not to purchase. Some people live and die by them. Some people hate them and will never get one, but that's personal preference. But if they have the home warranty, the ideal situation is they would pay the service fee 60, 70 bucks. The HVAC tech would come out, look at the home warranty or look at the HVAC and fix it. So long as it's not a pre-existing condition. So if you have a clean bill of health on it with your inspector, you could say, hey, this inspector said it was fine. So this is a new issue or whatever. But again, it's just will they or won't they actually fix the stuff? But it is a nice insurance policy. Any other questions on that? Yep. Okay. Since sellers aren't typically buying those home warranties right now, mm -hmm. are you seeing more people not get them or like? I'm seeing a lot of people not getting them, but I'm also seeing a lot of buyers just pay for them out of their own pocket if they're into it. Some buyers don't want them, they hate them. Um, I know certain um, agents will buy for the client, and I think that's really nice. However, I just think we have to be careful when we start handing money out of our own pocket, in my opinion. Um, it's just, we work so hard, and I just strongly encourage you to keep as much money in your pocket as you can. You know, encourage them to get the home warranty, explain it can be paid at closing, explain all those things. But, you know, I, I, it just depends on if they want one really but sellers aren't buying them they're just not anything else oh i have one question um so whenever a buyer asks you like is now a good time to buy or what's the best time things like that with this market what what, what do you answer what do or you answer? i want to sell or i don't want to buy in this market yeah like how, what, how do you handle that those objections or it's 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 you know what the way i look at it I always tell my clients, listen, I'm on your timeline. When you're ready to sell or buy, I'll be here. I'll go as fast or as slow as you want me to. You just let me know. Because ultimately, if financially it's not the right decision for them, it's not the right decision for them. This is their livelihood. This is their life. This is their home. Now, when people say it's now a good time to buy, say, hey, I'll be honest with you. Interest rates are really low. However, with that being said, inventory is also low and it's a very competitive market. It really just depends on what you feel is right. I'd be happy to get you with a lender, talk about that. You know, we can figure out kind of what you might look for. But I mean, just be honest, you know, because there are positives to buying right now as far as low interest rates and things like that. But there's, I mean, you just have, yeah. I mean, honestly, it's probably, it's not the best time. But I mean, how, how do you say? Yeah. But then you also say, you know what? I don't know what tomorrow will bring, but right now this is where we're at and stuff like that. And like with sellers that like, I don't blame them, you know, I mean, I'm sure we could all look at our homes and say, man, I can make a killing on my house or whatever. But 
what do you do? Because all the money you made off your property, unless you're just making a ton, for the most part, if you want anything comparable, you're going to have to spend more and then spend on top of that. So it's kind of, uh, I just, you know, I look at that as if it's not the right time, that's okay. I'll stay in contact and we'll sell in a year or whatever. They're just in my pipeline because I think that it's very important to remember that people, um, get it's the biggest purchase for sale they've ever made most of the time it's a very emotional process it's very tough and you just have to remember that because this yes this is our job and it is tough and we do care but this is their money their life their family and so i think whenever you are not pushy whenever you say i'm on your timeline whatever you want i think they respect you more for it and you're more likely to get their business and you're more likely for them to tell your friends about it you know, um, I had a client that referred me another client. We've been looking for four months, haven't found her something. Referred me a client, uh, got him in contract over the weekend. It just worked out, you know. Um, but she referred me because she saw when we would go in a house and it would be a piece of crap, I'd tell her, I don't think so. You know, I, I, the way I show homes and with clients, I'm way too honest with them about stuff. But you know what? I'd rather be, and they always appreciate it. Because I'm not one of the realtors that's like, oh my gosh, it's so charming. You know what I mean? Is this like falling down and stuff? Like I'm like, okay, so this is an issue and look there and just say appreciate it. Because buyers, especially first time buyers, they get real starstruck with houses and they're like, oh, it's so pretty. I'm like, no, honey, that's a coat of paint. You know, this is, you, you know what I mean? That's what you're there for. You're there to be the professional and, and to watch out for their best, best interests. And you always know, like, have to think, what I want my mom to live here, myself to live here, my kid, my cousin, whatever, you know? And and because some of these houses are they're crap and they're so overpriced, you know? So just be there. You have to be their watchdog. And they appreciate you for that. So, I mean, I had a client tell me at the closing table, we really appreciate all you've done. We're really excited about the house we got. But at first, I didn't even know if you really wanted us to buy a house. <gasps> because, you know, because we were, well, there was, I don't, and I remember the first house I showed them because we were talking about it. It had electricity out to the back porch. It was like extension cords and wires. Had, I mean, it was just like a fire hazard waiting to happen. I was like, no, and they're like, we kind of like it. I'm like, mm. I don't know. <laughs> you don't like it. Do you like $10,000 in electrical? Okay, good. Then you don't like it. So, anyway. But I mean, it's kind of funny, but I'd rather be that kind of realtor yeah. than the kind that's pushing my client into buying something and overpaying and getting sued in a few years for it. So, yeah. anyway. Fun stuff. And I know it's, I know lately we're probably, it's a little bit doom and gloom just because it is so tough, but it's going to get better, y'all. I hope so. It will. It will. We'll stay goes like this all the time. Just stick with it. Because I know it's frustrating and sellers want everything for free and buyers don't want to pay for stuff. And it's just hard. It's a really hard market. My brother yeah. said that, yeah, they're like this past weekend. They were negotiating repairs for one of the houses that he's a, the, the listing agent for, and he had to pay for a forty dollar door because that was the way to break the deal. Oh, I've, oh my God! Door. No, one of my very first deals was a new build, and this lady wanted oil. I can't ever say oil, oil or oil rub bronze. She wanted bronze all throughout, okay, with the handles and fixtures and all that. So she got it. We go in the house. And the tiny little half door that goes to the attic had brushed nickel. She about lost her ever loving mind. So it was going to blow up a deal over a doorknob. Oh so me and the builder rep split it. And yes, we did over a doorknob. That was like, hello? You know, but we did. We did. We, she got, and she got her an old rub. I mean, she's probably going to put a couch in front of it. Like, she wouldn't even know, but she would have, it was like, she was one of those people, she would have known it was there. And they, because what happened was at the design center, the lady didn't check one box. So, you know, they're also, yeah. you know, paper and system oriented. And so, yeah, I mean, it's stupid. It's the dumbest thing ever. It's so stupid. But we do stuff like that. Yeah. But I recommend as much as possible not doing that because eventually you're going to end up with no money. Yeah. Just saying. 
So yeah, it's tough. It's tough. It really is. But y'all are all, I'll send all y'all, if I think I got some emails, yes, I can. Um, I'll send y'all the, uh, uh, the checkoff list. And, and keep in mind, it's just really basic. And if you have questions on it, um, holler at me. But it's pretty basic. It's pretty easy. You can alter it. It's just in Word. And it's really just, I mean, it's nothing I share with my client. It's just for me, you know. Um, and it pretty much goes through it, things like that. So do you do it kind of in order? Yeah, okay. pretty much. I'll do, um, I'll have like, just like the buyer and seller information at the top, like different just info. I'll have required buyer forms with just like the buyer, like the groundwater and the this and the that. And then I'll have contract forms after, you know, it's, it's okay. pretty, it's pretty straightforward. So, yeah. yeah. So I'll send that to you guys and you can find, you can find lots of good uh, checklists online too. I'm sure I just kind of made, I took one from somebody and then added this and that, and I change it all the time. But I think it's super, because you have to be on your deadlines, right? And I think it's super, because there'll be times that I'm just not even thinking, but I always try when I have my contracts, I have them all on my desk. I try to open them up every so often. Even if I don't think there's anything going on, I still open it and look. Because inevitably, I forgot something, or oh crap, I need to get that done. You know, most of the time I'm on it, but let's be honest, <laughs> we all have our times, and we're like, where am I? What day it is? <laughs> day is it? So, um, but I mean it, you guys. Call me, email me. I'm, I love helping people. I really do. I love the contract questions, even if I don't have a freaking clue what you're talking about. I'll find out somebody who does. Um, but I'm, I'm excited for y'all. I know it's a crazy time to get in, but gosh. Once you get started, if you can make it in this market, you can make it in any market. I'm just saying. My first deal was a HUD house. I don't know if you guys are familiar with those, but those are actually HUD-owned properties that are foreclosed, and they don't have utilities. They don't have, they don't have electricity. They're usually people in the past were very angry and they like spray painted and ripped carpet and did all kinds so of stuff. So they put like nails or like needles on the ground. Oh like, yeah, it's just crazy stuff. Like the one I had, it didn't have some appliances um, that we, whenever we did the inspection, we found that this, the previous seller or the homeowner was so angry, he cut the power to the air conditioner. So that had to be told, I mean, it was just a nightmare and it was so different, like all their paperwork and stuff. And I just, and it was just a nightmare the entire way. And I thought, if I can make it through this, I can. Because also in a HUD house, whenever you get your inspection, you're supposed to stay there the whole time. The inspector's not allowed to be in the in the property unaccompanied. That's like four so, hours. Yeah, so it's especially when you don't have air conditioning and it's the middle of summer. Oh my god. Yeah. So yeah, it is. So y'all just let me know. Y'all too, I know y'all see me here, but I keep wanting to look back at y'all. But anybody, y'all let me know if y'all need anything at all. I'm excited for y'all. It's, we're, it's gonna get, we're gonna be good. There might be something in the chat. We've been seeing this, I don't know if they mean like, no, something at the top of the yeah. Yeah, I'm Jake Jones. Okay, I need to write these people down. Anyway, thank y'all for coming here on a Monday. I know Mondays are brutal, man. Thank you, Tori. Thank you guys for coming. I appreciate y'all. You bet. Y'all have any other questions, comments, concerns? Thank you so much. Thank I you. definitely will be calling. My brother calls you all the time. Oh, yeah. I love you. <laughs> Thanks, Tori. Thank you. Let's see here. So Yeah, absolutely.
No, not at all. Happy to help. I'm just trying to get this thing closed out. Hold on one second. Close. Okay, stop, share, end. Okay, I think I got everybody. Okay. End meeting for all.